Hi, welcome to Living Hope. You know, here we really love Jesus. We love to worship and, and pray for one another. And we really love the Word of God. Now, all that is about to start, so we're glad that you're with us. Well, this morning I have one joke. It's a good one, and it's a little bit longer. So I've, I've disciplined myself, and I only have one joke. So one day Einstein had to speak at an important science conference. On the way there, he tells his driver, I'm sick of all of these conferences. I always say the same things over and over and over. This was before TED Talks, right? So you couldn't put it on the internet. The driver agrees, you're right. As your driver, I've, I've attended all of them. And I even, even though I don't know a thing about science, I think that I could even deliver your, your speech in your place because we even kind of look alike. That's a great idea, says Einstein. Let's switch places. So they switch clothes as soon as they arrive and the driver, dressed as Einstein, goes on stage and starts giving the usual speech while the real Einstein, dressed as the car driver, attends it. But in the crowd, there's one scientist who wants to impress everyone and thinks of a very difficult question to ask Einstein, hoping that he won't be able to respond. So the guy stands up, interrupting the conference, and poses this very difficult question. The whole room goes silent, holding their breath, waiting to hear what Einstein would have to say. And the driver looks at him dead in the eye and says, that's such an easy question, I'm going to refer to my driver. In the last few sermons that I've, that I've given, we've been talking about letting go of the things of this world, letting go of our sinful nature, letting go of the acts of the flesh, and grabbing hold of what God has for us. God has, the, we talked about grabbing hold of the character of the kingdom, which is the fruit of the spirit. We talked about grabbing hold of all that God has for us, and letting go of all that the world is trying to offer us. We can even give up things that are seemingly mundane or, or not that important. Things like money and our jobs and our friendships. We can give over control of those things to God because we need to not find life in them, but we need to find life in Christ and in Christ alone. Then we talked about uh, our need to, to be in the Spirit and acting in the Spirit, following and acting in the fruit of the Spirit, the character of the kingdom. And finally, today we're going to talk about one more thing that Jesus paved the way for us to grab hold of. If you're a follower of Christ, what we're talking about this morning is of full access to you. If you're not a follower of Christ, we can fix that later today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you're here that your word is alive, that it is true, that it is good. Father, we, we ask that you would be present as we look into your word, as we receive from your word. Lord, would you use me to speak truth, to speak life, to bring new freedom and new levels of ministry to each and every one here this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. I believe this ser sermon will be a blessing and encouragement to every single one of you here. And I believe more specifically that it is coming at a very important time in many of your lives. God wants to set you free from certain expectations, whether you have put them on yourself or whether somebody else has imposed those expectations on you. God wants to set you free of those expectations. So I'm not sure if I've ever shared my uh, full testimony of God calling me into ministry. Uh, so I want to do that this morning. When I was, I gave my life to Christ when I was 15 years old. And I was just attending youth group and I attended youth group for another couple of years. And it was, it was a lot of fun. But I was also working a lot, so I didn't get to go every week. 
So I would drop in, and I would talk to the youth pastor every once in a while. And it took him about three or four times of telling me, you really should go to Bible school. You'd love it there. It's fantastic. Bunch of great people and a bunch of great women there, too. <laughs> well, after hearing that a few times, I got to thinking, you know, I, I think I would like to go to Bible school. I think I would like to, to get a better understanding of my faith. I'd like to get a better understanding of how to share my faith and, and how to disciple people. That, that sounds like a good idea. So, so I, I, I felt the Lord really impressing it on my heart to, to go to Bible college. And so, so I, I told my parents, I said, well, Dad, I, my mom wasn't around that night, but I was talking to my dad, and I said, I think that I'm supposed to go to Bible school. I want to go to Bible college, and I want to have a, a better understanding of my faith, and I want to, to have uh, a better knowledge of the history of Christianity. I may have left out the spouse thing. <laughs> and, and he said, well, that's interesting, but we think that you should only go for an education unless it's for an occupation. We don't want you going anywhere unless it's for a job. Okay, so God was certainly in that conversation because the last number of weeks and, and months, God had been speaking to me about how to honor my parents. And even though they weren't serving the Lord, I wanted to honor them, and I wanted to respect them, and I wanted them to give me a blessing to go wherever I went. So... I was praying that night and I said, God, I, I was certain that you'd called me to ministry. I was, or sorry, I was certain that you'd called me to go to Bible school. And so I don't know what to do with this. You have to speak so clearly to me. I, I, I'm not sure what to do here. So that night I'm reading in my Bible, Matthew chapter 9, verse 37 and 38. It says, then Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out into his harvest. Well, that was pretty, uh, pretty clear as day to me. God had called me to be a pastor. And so the very next day, I was talking to my dad and I said, well, I think I'm going to go to Bible college and I'm going to be a pastor. He said, okay. So now that it was for a job, he was fine with it. So now, I wasn't just going for one or two years. To get my bachelor's, I had to go for four. And not only was I walking into something that was going to stretch me and was going to make me a little bit uncomfortable, it also ended up stretching my parents and making them a little bit uncomfortable. Because I got my bachelor's in biblical studies. And then, right after I finished my internship, I, I went to Africa for four months. And I went on a missions trip there. And, and my parents weren't really sure if I was ever going to come back, whether they were afraid that I just would catch the missions bug and never want to come back to Canada, or whether they thought I was going to get some sort of persecution and die there, I don't know. But they, they were ready to, to, give, to say goodbye to me when they said goodbye to me that January. And so it, it definitely stretched them. And, and after my time in, in Africa, I came back to Estevan because I, I still had a, a great relationship with Scott and with, with Living Hope, and so I wanted to be involved in ministry. I knew I could do that if I came back here. So I moved back to Estevan, started full-time work. I, I started serving in the church. I learned how to play bass guitar, and I was up here playing bass a lot. And I think I was also on the sound team at that time. I co-led a home group with Lorna. And I also served as a deacon in that time. So I was, I was involved in many different ways. And I did that for a number of years. But after a few years, I got to thinking, did I hear God incorrectly? Did I miss my opportunity to serve in ministry? Did I miss my time to step in as a pastor somewhere? And I, I had a, a season there where I, 
really wrestled with whether or not I was actually called to ministry, whether or not I was supposed to be a pastor, or whether I was to continue serving as a home group leader, serving on the worship team, and serving as a deacon. And, and then, in August of 2010, eight years ago, this month, Scott had me in his, his office for a meeting, and he slid a piece of paper over his desk at me with a, a long list of attributes on it. And he said, this is what we need in an associate pastor. I was a deacon at the time, so it was normal for him to have those kind of conversations with me. I didn't think anything of it until he slid that same piece of paper with about three quarters of them highlighted. And he says, and this is what I see you capable of doing. Well, that changed the conversation entirely. And because I had given up my control of whether or not I was going to be a pastor, and I had also kind of thought that my time had had come and gone, that I'd missed it somehow, I had to wrestle again with whether or not God really was calling me to full-time ministry. I had to make sure. I didn't want to step into this position lightly, and so I had to make sure of my calling. So October of 2010, at the LifeLinks conference in, uh, it was actually in Medicine Hat at this time, I, I felt the call again to full-time ministry, and I started as associate pastor in January 2011, and I'm really, really happy I did, because I know that, that God has been a part, of, a part of this, my calling, and a part of this ministry. For all pastors, if you were to ask them, when, when did God call you to ministry? When did God say, be a pastor? I'm certain that they could point you to a time and a place where they knew that God called them to pastoral ministry, where they knew God called them to be a pastor full-time. But, but not all of us are pastors. Not all of us are pastors. There's a lot of us that aren't pastors. Not everyone is called to full-time ministry in the church as a pastor. So what are you called to? What are you called to? Well, the Bible says that we are called to a lot of different things. A lot of different things. We're going to talk this morning that we need to grab hold of our calling. That we each have a calling. Callings aren't just for pastors. Callings are for all Christians. We need to let go of the limitations that the earth, that the world, that the, our co-workers and uh, that society wants to place on us. That as we get older, we're, we're more and more obsolete. We need to throw that idea out. We need to let go of that idea. We need to grab hold of our callings in Christ. Some of the things in Scripture that we are called to and it's, it's a bit of a list. The Bible says that all Christians are called to holiness, to God's purpose, to grace. You can look up those references, 2 Timothy 1.9 and Romans 8.28, which we'll look at actually later. The Bible says that we are all called into God's marvelous light, 1 Peter 2.9. We are all called to peace, 1 Corinthians 7.15 and Colossians 3.15. The Bible says that we are all called to sanctification, 1 Thessalonians 4, 7. We are all called to the purposes of God, also in Romans 8, 28. We are all called to live a life worthy of the calling that we received in Ephesians 4, 4 1. 4, 1? Yeah, 4, 1. We are all called to fix our thoughts on Christ, and declare him to be God's messenger and high priest. That's 10 already. We're all called to give blessings, not curses, because we are called to a blessing. We are all called to be an example of Christ, 1 Peter 2.21. And we are all called to each of these forever, because God's call and his gifts are irrevocable. Romans 11.29. So this list of things is not just 
what pastors or missionaries or, or elders are called to. This, these are things that, as Christians, we are all called into. Looking at this list can be quite intimidating, quite daunting, and maybe even make you feel inadequate that you could never, ever get there. But the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. His power has given us absolutely everything that we need. That whole list, that the two slides there, God has given us everything we need to do everything on those slides. We are not at lack of anything to do what God wants us to do. One of my greatest fears in, in this life, and especially in this ministry, is that I would not be able to fulfill what God asked me to do. That I would not be useful to God. That I would get myself in a place where I am not serving a purpose. That's one of my fears, which is a healthy fear to a certain degree, but not completely. I do not want to be obsolete, but... God is not like this world. God does not make things obsolete. God does not let things, like God does not let people become obsolete. God continues to invest in each of us. I have a couple of obsolete electronic devices, tablets which are, in the history of the world, still quite new. And smartphones, also in the history of the world, still quite new. But they're obsolete. They're old. The operating systems are old. The manufacturers aren't going to update the operating system. The developers aren't developing the apps anymore. And so if I go to update the app, it'll update it to an app that won't work with my operating system. And so I can't even open it. These, these are obsolete. But you are not. Doesn't matter how old you are. Doesn't matter how young you are. You have a purpose in the kingdom. God has not let you become obsolete. These devices are, but you are not. You serve a function in the kingdom. Let's take a look now at Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Oh, I missed that last verse in First Peter. It says, For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge. Here's Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So this verse is it's quite self-explanatory. If you read it one or two times over, you can, you can get a really good understanding of what Paul is trying to say here in Romans. God works through all things. God doesn't make all things happen, but God works through all things. He can use everything for all of us who love him and are called according to his purpose. This verse also clarifies who it's talking about. It's saying that all of us, all the people of God, everyone who loves God has been called according to his purpose. Not my purpose. I wanted to be a policeman. But God called me to be a pastor. I was, I'm called, and so are you, according to his purposes, not according to our own. 
Not a single one of us present in this room is absent of purpose. Not a single one of us present in this room is absent of purpose. We need to remember that. Because the world wants to tell us otherwise. The devil is whispering, whispering in our ears, telling us how inadequate or obsolete we are. But we all have a purpose and a calling. This is, uh, Romans is a very quotable scripture because it, it's powerful. It's, it says good things and we get really excited about what it says. But we also need to realize what it implies. It implies that as followers of Christ, we all have a purpose. We all have a purpose. And it's harder, harder to imply, to apply the implication than it is to understand the definition of this verse. But that's what we need to endeavor to do in order to be men and women of integrity. Our next verse that we're going to look at is 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 20. It says, Each person should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. There are a couple exceptions to that, I believe. But this verse is really encouraging because it means that if you are a policeman and, and you give your life to Christ... You don't have to quit working as a policeman or a police officer. You can serve God in that occupation. You can still serve God there. You don't have to quit and go into full-time ministry. Not everyone is called to full-time ministry, but we are all called to God's purpose. And ministry is no more important than any other occupation, as long as we're doing them both for his purposes, for his glory, with his understanding. As long as our jobs, when, we're, when we give our life to Christ, as long as they're not unethical, or as long as they're not immoral, we can serve in that capacity, we can continue in that job, serving the Lord because God needs Christians everywhere. We need to be salt and light in this earth. When we apply the truth of this previous verse, Romans 8.28, to 1 Corinthians 7.20, we quickly see that God can use whatever job we have. Because that falls under all things. In all things, right? God is working within it for our good and so we should remain there if it's ethical and if it's moral. Which brings me to 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11. It says, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Here Peter mentions serving and speaking as just two of the different ways that we can serve. If you look up in the different lists of, of ministries and abilities in Scripture listed in Romans 12, 6 through 8, 1 Corinthians 12, 8 through 11, and Ephesians 4, 11. Every single one of those ways of serving the Lord are all ways of serving people as well. They're ways of serving the church and lifting up and encouraging the body of Christ. There are many different ways that God can use people and everyone here has been given at least one of these gifts. At least one. You have a way that God wants to use you to accomplish his purposes. Too often we believe the lie that the world or the enemy wants to tell us that you're, you're too young 
or you're too old. You're, you're too educated or you're not educated enough. You are too religious or you have been in the world too long. The world wants to tell us that we are disqualified. And the enemy wants to tell us that we're disqualified too. But I want to tell you today, you are not disqualified. You are called according to his purposes. You have a purpose. Often we are tempted to not grab hold of this calling. But I want to encourage you to let go of the things that this world tells you. Let go of the things that the enemy wants to tell you about your lack of calling. And I want you to grab hold of your calling this morning. We need to grab hold of our callings. Earlier this morning, I shared my story of God calling me into pastoral ministry. Maybe you had a similar experience of God calling you into your occupation, into your job. And even if you didn't, you are called according to his purposes. God created you a certain way. God brought you into Estevan into 2018 for a reason. He made you to be you. He made you to be used by him in that way. Yes, we are all in the process of sanctification to be made more and more like him, but uniquely like the way he made us. We often like to segregate people apart from ourselves. We like to differentiate and understand what sets us apart. And sometimes we even do that in the church. We, we, we find ourselves comparing, well, I'm better at this than that person. So I'm, I'm higher on the scale. But this, that other person, they're better than me. They're more gracious. They're a better prayer warrior. They're better at worshiping God than I am. And I, I don't think that's healthy at all. It does not help us to compare to each other. That only separates us. That only brings us further apart. That does not bring us together. Comparing others always separates. When I'm doing dishes, I separate the dirty dishes from the clean dishes. And that's healthy. That's good. I don't want to cross-contaminate. But if we're in the kingdom, if we're all believers, there is no clean or dirty there is no clean or dirty. There is no sacred or secular in the kingdom of God. If you are a believer, you are sacred, which is set apart for him. Secular, just useful in this world. As believers, we are all sacred and called according to him. I don't think, going back to the dishes comment, I don't think God does dishes. Because he is in his craft room. He is creating people. He's creating us out of clay and out of dust. Adam was built from the dust of the earth. We're descendants of Adam. And when we die, our bodies become dust again. We're all dust. Each and every one of us. Doesn't matter how old we are. Doesn't matter color of our skin. Doesn't matter what language we speak. We are all dust the same you and I and everyone else on this planet are all the same we have different abilities there is no clean or dirty in the kingdom once we are in the kingdom we are sacred I found an excellent explanation on this written by Bob Thune who is a, I might be pronouncing his name wrong he is a pastor and author and I want to read what he says the root of the English word vocation is the Latin verb voca, which means to call. The linguistic evidence shows that at some point in history, people thought of every type of work as a calling. Whether you are a minister or a mechanic, you do not work because it pays the bills or because it's personally fulfilling or because it justifies the money you spent on college tuition. You work because it glorifies 
God. He continues, if we are to live all of life for the glory of God, which we are according to 1 Corinthians 10, 31, then we need a God-centered view of work itself. It's not enough that we try to honor God in how we do our work or that we try to be Christ-like to people at work or even that we support God's kingdom with the money we make from work. The glory of God must inform and transform our view of work itself. And he ends with this. Here's what I mean. Most non-Christians see work simply as a means to an end. Work provides them with beer money or a fat retirement pension or a better life for their kids. Unfortunately, many Christians see work in exactly the same way. We may be pursuing more Christ-like ends. Money to tithe or an opportunity to witness to a co-worker, for instance. But our view of work itself is still fundamentally unchanged. We still see work as a means to an end. We are using work. We're in it for what we get out of it. God may be honored in the results of our work, but he is not supreme in our view of work itself. And that's the problem. God must be considered when we consider our view of work. He has each of us where we are for a reason and for a purpose. Work is not just for a paycheck. God, ha- Why has God placed you in that place and in that, this time? Why not somebody else? Why not somewhere else? God has you there for a reason. He wants you to make a difference in your job for his kingdom. Even if we're retired, which I have many years to get there, but for those of you that are retired, you can still serve God. Because it's not position that shows purpose. It's pulse that shows purpose. It's pulse that shows purpose. I skipped ahead a bunch, sorry. Pulse shows purpose. Take your first two fingers on your dominant hand. Check your pulse. Yes, you do have one. (laughs) Keep checking, it's there. Trust me, it's there. Now check your neighbor's pulse. Check... Check to see if they have a pulse. Come on, everybody check. We're all family here. Everybody check your neighbor's pulse. She's alive? Is he alive? Is there a pulse? If there's a pulse, there's a purpose. If there's a pulse, there's a purpose. If you can't find a pulse, we have an AED machine just outside these doors that we can test out on you. But I'm pretty sure it would tell you that you have a pulse if we hooked it up to you. If there's a pulse, there's a purpose. Pulse shows purpose. As Christians, we are all called to purpose, to the purpose of God. Grab hold of your calling. Callings aren't just for pastors. Callings are for Christians. Callings aren't just for pastors. Callings are for Christians. The Bible demonstrates in many different ways that he's used many different people to fulfill, that was a mouthful, to fulfill his purposes. And as I looked over and as I recall the different people mentioned in Scripture, I can't think of, a, of two people in the Bible that are called exactly the same way, that are called to exactly the same thing. We're all unique. We're all called, though, to his purposes. Abraham was called to go to another land. Abraham was a missionary. Mary was called to bear the Son of God and to raise him. She was called to be a stay-at-home mom. Joseph, Jesus' earthly dad, 
was called to raise a boy to be a man. Moses was called to free slaves and to lead them in a convoy. He was called to be an activist and a camp director. Joseph, the son of Isaac, was called to Egypt in a very unique way. He was called to be a businessman and to interpret dreams. Esther was a beautiful woman, and God used her beauty to influence a king into saving her people. The Bible's filled with many other similar examples of people used by God, how he created them to fulfill what he needed to get done. We build the kingdom of God in so many different ways. It takes people of all walks of life. It takes people of all gifts and abilities to build the kingdom of God. If every single person was like me, they would be lacking the individual gifts and abilities that each of you represent, that each of you has. You're important in the kingdom of God. You have a purpose in the kingdom of God. There is a place for everyone, not only at the table of God and in his church. There's a place for everyone to help build the kingdom of God here on earth, and yes, here in Estevan and at Living Hope. If you're a Christian, you have a calling. No excuses. Here's another list of people from the Bible. And Along with the list of them, there are different reasons why the world would say they don't qualify, why the enemy would say they are obsolete, they don't qualify for God's purposes. Noah was a drunk. Abraham was too old. Isaac was a daydreamer. Jacob was a liar. Leah was ugly. Joseph was abused. Moses was a murderer and couldn't talk. Gideon was afraid. Samson had long hair and was afraid. Rahab was a prostitute. Jeremiah and Timothy were too young. David was a murderer and an adulterer. Elijah was suicidal. Isaiah preached naked. Jonah ran from God. Naomi was a widow. Job went bankrupt. John the Baptist ate bugs and he probably stank. Peter denied Christ. The disciples fell asleep while praying. Martha worried about everything. Mary Magdalene was demon-possessed. The Samaritan woman was divorced more than once. Zacchaeus was too small. Paul was a murderer and was too religious. Timothy had an ulcer and Lazarus was dead. Now he's the exception to pulse. (laughs) He didn't even have a pulse and yet God still had a purpose for him. God is even beyond that, right? I won't hold you to that, though. But God is saying, and God demonstrates through the scriptures, that pulse shows purpose. You are the most qualified person to speak for you. You are the most qualified person to say what God is doing in your life. Sure, someone may be able to say it more eloquently or with, uh, with a little bit more passion, but you are the most qualified person to speak for what God is doing in your life. You're the most qualified person to testify for you. I can't share your story like you can. I can't tell people your feelings and your struggles like you can. Sure, someone might say it better, as I said, but you say it your own way, and God made you that way for a reason. You telling your story is more powerful than me or anyone else telling your story. If I can get the prayer team and the worship team to come, please. There are four different categories of, of, of people here this morning. One, there are those of us here that are believers, that are aware of where God has called us, where we are uniquely gifted and able and are serving in that capacity. That's awesome. If you're in that category this morning, 
That is so good. I'm very happy that you're serving the Lord where he's gifted you and, and where he's made you able to serve. The next step for you is to find someone else that's called and able in those areas and to help raise them up, to help disciple them. Second category of people here this morning is those that know exactly where you are called and know exactly where you're gifted and yet you're not serving in those capacities. For whatever reason, whether you perceive a lack of opportunity or whether you think you're disqualified, I'm here to tell you you're not disqualified. You checked your pulse. And, and we determine that you have a pulse and that you have a purpose. If all you're looking for is opportunity, there are opportunities for ministry in, in all of the ministries we have at Living Hope. There's no single one that's full because I believe that God is moving here in Estevan. And we're going to see these empty seats filled to capacity. I believe that we're going to have multiple services that God is going to bring hurting people that need Him. So we need to have our ministries not just at capacity for where we're at now. We need to prepare for a move of God. We need to have more people serving than we, than we need for right now. Thirdly, if you don't know your gifts and abilities... The prayer team wants to pray with you. The prayer team wants to help you hear from the Lord. The prayer team wants to encourage you in the different ways that they see God moving in your life. They want to encourage you in, in the ways that they know you are able to serve. You are able to serve. Paul shows purpose. We are all called according to his purposes and finally if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior so you couldn't be serving him because you don't know him if you want to know how you can personally know Jesus I can lead you in giving your life to him right now I told you earlier this in the sermon that there'd be an opportunity to give your life to Christ and it's as easy as ABC Accept that you're a sinner, that you can't, and you haven't done everything perfectly. Be, believe in Jesus as that perfect sacrifice for your life. Believe that He alone can bring words of life. And see, choose to follow Him today, tomorrow, and every day of your life. You know, a friend once told me, and I actually found it kind of surprising, that a lot of people don't understand that they're welcome at church. Now, some people, he said, have the idea that church is like a, a club where you should be a member before you attend things. But we want you to know it's not like that, and we would love it if you could join us at Living Hope. We're on the corner of King and Kensington. We have services Sunday morning. You can check our website to, or check the newspaper for our service times. We'd love to have you come. Uh, apart from that, though, we're glad that you are with us and hope that you'll join us again.